Hello and welcome to chapter four in computers and healthcare. We are going to be discussing system selection. So um, sliding through these learning objectives, we're going to get to the definition of system selection. It's basically determining which information system is going to be purchased. Um, system selection begins with the idea that you need a new information system. Could be a master patient index, something like that. The process is going to continue until the contract has been signed. And the complexity of the system selection process is going to vary widely from selecting a standard off-the-shelf software product like a word processor to the very complex implementation of an electronic health record system. And the length of time and the number of people involved are also going to vary. So in this chapter, we're talking about the system development life cycle. This is a model used to represent the ongoing process of developing or purchasing an information system. And for the purposes of this chapter, um, the model we're using has four steps. Those four steps are planning and analysis, design, implementation, and support and evaluation. And so dropping down, talking about planning and analysis on page 44. This is the process of identifying and assigning priorities to the application of information technology that will assist an organization in ex executing its business plans and achieving its strategic goals and objectives. So you want to choose a system that is going to meet your business objectives. Why spend money um, on a system that's not going to help you meet your, your goals and meet your needs? So if your, your desire as an organization is to increase the quality of patient care, then you would want to make sure that whatever system you chose was going to help you achieve that goal. All right, so the steps included in the planning and analysis phase are number one, planning, number two, organizing the project, number three, defining the scope of the project, and number four, systems analysis. All right, so let's start with planning over on page 45. Planning is the most critical step in the system selection process. Let me repeat that. Planning is the most critical step in the system selection process. A major information system selection requires a lot of collaborative work by many people across a healthcare facility. A lack of planning can cause problems with the system, which can ultimately cause the system to fail or delay the implementation date, thus costing the healthcare facility money and wasted resources. An example of poor planning is ordering hardware without evaluating the space. Insufficient space can prohibit hard hardware installation when there's not enough electrical wiring, inadequate space, or some other problem with the physical plant. And these are the most common reasons for failure. Poor planning and direction, insufficient communication, ineffective management, failure to meet the needs of the stakeholders, lack of involvement from executive leadership, lack of skills by staff, and weak methodology and tools. Another reason for failure is the lack of end user involvement. Employees who are involved in the system selection and implementation are more likely to embrace the information system than those who are not. In a, if a healthcare facility spends more time and energy from the beginning of the information system selection project, it will be better positioned to succeed. Because again, planning is the most critical step. Adequate planning is demonstrated in part when the healthcare facility has the necessary staff, money, and other resources, as well as an understanding of what is needed and identification of desired outcomes from the outset of the project. Planning for an information system is a complex process and involves the following. So conducting a feasibility study. A feasibility study is conducted by the healthcare facility to determine if a proposed information system is an appropriate option to meet the objectives of the healthcare facility. For example, the healthcare facility could investigate the feasibility of implementing an EHR to support an objective to improve the quality of care. The study examines the cost, the benefits, and any expected problems, and then determines whether or not to proceed with the proposed information system. The, benefit, the benefits should be both tangible and intangible. 
Intangible benefits <clears throat> are easy to quantify in dollars and include eliminating duplicate tests, no longer having to purchase health record file folders, and not microfilming paper records. Intangible benefits cannot be quantified monetarily. An example of an intangible benefit would be improved quality of care. If the benefits do not outweigh the cost, then the project should be considered. If the benefits do outweigh the cost, excuse me. All right, number two in planning is setting the budget. Developing the budget for a system selection project is important as cost is a key determining factor in deciding whether or not to implement an information system. The budget should be comprehensive and as accurate as possible because it is used in the decision making process. The budget should include system selection and implementation expenses as well as the cost of maintaining the information for a specified period of time, such as two to five years. Additionally, the budget should include items such as cost of software, upgrading infrastructure, hardware, training, renovations to the physical plant, maintenance of the information system, project management, consultant expenses, and travel expenses for site visits. All right, our third part of planning is our goals and objectives. Goals and objectives for the information system must be established as part of the planning process. The goals and objectives identify what the healthcare facility wants to accomplish with the implementation of the proposed system and how these goals will be achieved. These information system goals should be based on the healthcare facility's business goals. As with any goals, they should be realistic and obtainable. And so our strategy for writing goals should be the SMART methodology, which stands for specific, measurable, obtainable, relevant, and time-based. A specific goal tells you the what, who, where, when, which, and why. A measurable goal provides something that you can use to compare the actual outcome to the goal to determine if it has been met. An attainable goal is one that you have the skills and resources to accomplish. A relevant goal is one that, while challenging, can be accomplished given time and other factors. And a timely goal is one that provides a deadline to meet. All right, now we are moving on to our um, next set is identifying the project manager and the team. That's our fourth section of planning. So the project manager and project team are an important part of project management. Project management is a formal set of principles and procedures that help control the activities associated with implementing a usually large undertaking to achieve a specific goal. A project team is a collection of individuals representing various disciplines such as billing, clinician, administration, or information technology assigned to work on a project. Their role is important because they are responsible for ensuring that the system implementation plan is carried out according to project manager specifications. And then we have our project manager. They are in charge of leading the project and therefore must have an understanding of the information system being implemented. The project manager must have strong skills in a multitude of areas, such as project management, leadership, organizational skills, conflict management. The project manager is responsible for ensuring that the project plan stays within the design timeline, issues are resolved, desired outcomes are met, and customer satisfaction is achieved. All right, and so our fifth um, process or, or step in planning is obtaining buy-in from management and users. It is critical that healthcare Facilities upper management support the project from the very beginning of the process. If management shows support for the information system, the employees will follow suit and support it. However, if management displays discontent or lack of support, the employees will most likely resist the change. Support can be shown by attending meetings, talking about the information system's benefits to the healthcare facility, its employees and customers, and generally demonstrating that the IS is valued. Communication is critical at this stage. Staff and everyone to be affected by the IS should receive ongoing updates on the decisions, changes, and expectations. So what is change management? 
Change management is the formal process of introducing change, getting it adopted, and diffusing it throughout the healthcare facility. Although some people welcome change, most have a natural aversion to it. A great deal of change management involves reducing these fears and preparing them for what is to come. For example, if people are afraid they will lose their jobs with the implementation of new technology, these issues must be addressed. Administration must be open and honest about layoffs, changes in job roles, and other related changes. All right, so let's talk about the organization of the project. That is the second part of planning. Um, so once a decision is made to implement an information system, the project's formal organizational structure must be put in place. A project is a plan and course of action that will address a specific objective made up of a series of activities and tasks with defined start and stop dates. The plan has targeted objectives and deliverables to be accomplished. The project will need to be specific the project will need specific resources assigned to it in order to be completed. A project frequently has a separate budget that sets limits on spending. Another resource assigned to a project is staff. As discussed previously, a project team is assigned to the project. Temporary employees may be hired to either assist in the implementation or assume the task of staff members who have been reassigned to the project. An example of a project is an implementation of an EHR. Members of the EHR project would involve many different types of professionals, including physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers, HIM professionals, computer programmers, network technicians, and many more. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the project team. Most, if not all, information systems require a project team of individuals to successfully implement the information system. The number of individuals needed and the composition of this team vary from project to project depending on the needs of the implementation. For example, if the healthcare facility is implementing a chart deficiency system for use only in the HIM department, the project team should include the appropriate people in HIM and the information system. The project team would not need to include physicians, nurses, risk managers, or laboratory staff. If the healthcare facility is implementing a computerized provider order entry, the physician, the project team would need representatives from the physician staff as well as HIM, nursing, lab, pharmacy, and other departments who are impacted. An HIM professional should frequently be on a project team because of the information system it may impact the HIM department indirectly and having the HIM professional involved will help ensure that the department's needs are addressed. Additionally, the HIM professional serves as a consultant and source of information for compliance, privacy, security, legal, and other concerns. For example, the HIM professional can assist with retention, privacy, security, data quality, and documentation issues, among many other considerations of the information system, which may ultimately affect the HIM department. The Information Systems Project Steering Committee is responsible for every information system acquisition project in the healthcare facility. Each project team will report back to the steering committee. The steering committee's role is to ensure that the strategic information system is being efficiently and effectively implemented and that the project stays on target. This committee is frequently led by the Chief Information Officer or the CIO. The CIO is generally at the executive level and is responsible for all information management functions at the healthcare facility. The user task force is a group of users who will ultimately be using the information system, who test the information system, and perform other project-related tasks for which the committee receives feedback. These users are generally on loan from various departments to assist in the project. Some members of the user task force may develop a need for testing or, or may be deployed as needed for testing, performing an examination or evaluation and other tasks, whereas others are pulled out of their departments for the duration of the project. This reassignment may last a year or more depending on the project. The vendor representative is the expert on the information system and so will be an extremely valuable team member. The individual will be the liaison between the healthcare facility and the leadership at the vendor's company. 
The vendor representative knows the product and can be a valuable resource with regard to how best to implement and use the information system. If the healthcare facility decides to hire a consultant, the consultant will be a valuable member of the project team as well. The consultant should not have ties to a particular vendor's product, but rather be objective to help the healthcare facility obtain the product that best meets their needs. The consultant should have experience in, experience in system selection and implementation. The project manager is responsible for coordinating the individual project, monitoring the budget, managing the resources, conducting negotiations, and keeping the project on schedule. These roles require the project manager to have technical, analytical, and people skills. The project manager should be skilled in conflict resolution, communication, and project management. All right, so let's define the scope of a project. So the healthcare facility must define what the accomplished project is. The project definition is determined during the project planning process to tell the healthcare facility exactly what it is trying to do with the information system being implemented and the expectation outco the expected outcomes. The healthcare facility must identify the purpose of the information system, how the system links to the healthcare facility's business strategy, and the goals and the scope for the project. So Defining that scope, sometimes you end up with scope creep. Now, this happens when items not included in the original scope are added after the project has begun. For example, if a project starts out to implement an EHR in a medical clinic, and then the decision is made to add the EHR to the outpatient surgery area, that was not a part of the original scope of the project. So, there's two different areas, two different needs, and more time and more resources are going to be required. All right, moving down to project plan. Once the healthcare facility knows what it plans to do, the project team can begin dividing the project into specific activities or tasks. The project team may start out with the basic skeleton of a project plan and continue to add substance to it as they go along. This project plan should describe each task to be completed, how it will be completed, who is responsible for its completion, when a task should begin, and when a task should be finished. The basic components are of a plan are as follows. Feasibility study, resources, design, hardware and software procurement, transition, implementation, and support and evaluation. Be sure to read about each one of those on page 49. All right, let's talk about some of our project management tools. A number of tools can be used to control the project. These tools include Gantt charts, project evaluation and review technique or PERT charts, project plans, trouble tickets, and status reports. A Gantt chart is a project management tool that records specific tasks, their start and end dates, the person responsible for the task, and any connections between tasks. The Gantt chart, which you can see an example of in Figure 4.2, can easily show which tasks are behind schedule, which are on target, and which are ahead of schedule. A PERT chart, see Figure 4.3, is a management tool that evaluates the task, the dependencies on other activities, the activity sequence, and the time required to complete the task. Because the PERT chart shows activities, the activity sequence, and the time required to complete the task, Oh, I'm sorry, got on the wrong line. Because the PERT chart shows interdependencies between tasks, it will help determine whether the implementation date is slipping because of delinquent tasks. This slippage is shown by review of the critical path, which shows the longest amount of time to complete the project. If key tasks along the critical path are delayed, the critical path itself lengthens, thus lengthening the duration of the project. Status reports are periodic updates on the current state of the project, what has been accomplished, and what issues have been encountered. Solutions for the issues should be identified in the report. St status reports are typically directed to the Information Project Steering Committee to keep that information, the group informed on the project's progress. All right, so flipping over to page 52, we're gonna start with system analysis. 
System analysis is an important process of collecting, organizing, and evaluating data on the healthcare facility and information that it needs. System analysis should be performed early in the project as it helps the project team to determine the data, storage, reporting, and functionality needs of the healthcare facility. In system analysis, the healthcare facility determines what users need to be proposed, need from the proposed information system. This stage reviews the current processes of the healthcare facility, the, pros the proposed processes, and the desired functional requirements. Functional requirements describe the functionality that an information system should be able to perform. All right, moving over to 53, second paragraph. To identify the needs of a healthcare facility for the foreseeable future, the project team needs to understand the environment in which the system will operate. No one can see into the future with certainty, but internal and external environmental scanning can identify some issues that must be addressed. Internal scanning entails identifying changes within the healthcare facility that will impact the information system, such as new services or new clinics that will be implemented. External scanning is identifying changes outside of the healthcare facility that will impact the healthcare facility. The healthcare facility may be aware of pending legislation, trends, or other issues that may impact the information system under consideration. Questionnaires, interviews, observations, flowcharts, and other data collection tools may be used to obtain data needed to answer these questions. The planning team should collect data from all levels and types of users. The needs of the clerical staff will be very different from the needs of management staff. Many managers believe they know the needs of their staff, but many of them know the policy, what the policy states, not what is actually happening. Questionnaires allow for a large number of users to provide input about the needs of an information system as the results are easy to collect and analyze. This is especially true if closed-ended questions are used so that the responses can be tabulated quickly and easily. Closed-ended questions can be answered with a yes or no, Likert scales, and other limited choice responses. Likert scales are great for obtaining the user's beliefs regarding a statement. An example of a Likert scale begins with the following. On a scale of 1 to 5, with 1 being strongly agree and 5 being strongly disagree, rate the following statement. So your Likert scales are when you're given, you know, 1 through 5, rate the following 1 through 10, write the following. 1, you hate it. 10, you love it. So those are Likert scales. Interviews are powerful tools for obtaining information. There are three types of interviews, structured, unstructured, and semi-structured. In the structured interview, everyone is asked the same questions. This improves analysis of the findings, but does not encourage the interviewee to talk openly about pertinent issues, thus taking the risk that important data will be overlooked. In the unstructured interview, the interviewer does not have a list of questions, but rather gets the interviewees talking about their jobs, their data needs, and other issues related to the information system. The semi-structured interview is a combination of the structured and unstructured formats. There are questions that the interviewees are asked, but they are also encouraged to discuss in detail their jobs, data needs, and other issues related to their information system needs. The unstructured and semi-structured formats make it harder to identify trends and to analyze data, but major issues that could have been overlooked may be identified. Observation is watching an action being performed. It is useful in determining what employees are actually doing. This is important because supervisors or other frequently or others frequently tell the interviewers what they think is happening, but in reality, something very different is occurring. And flow charts may be used to illustrate the flow of information within the healthcare facility. And you can see figure 4.4 for an example. Flowchart uses standardized symbols to demonstrate the steps performed. Problems and inconsistencies are identified through the development and analysis of the flowchart. All right, so let's talk about the design phase can either build, buy, or use cloud computing. So let's talk about these three. So after the project itself has been decided on and the formal structure has been created, a number of decisions have to be made. The design should reflect information system objectives, output spe 
specifications, input specifications, database design, and expected cost. The requirements identified in systems analysis are used to create specifications for the information system. Specifications will be used for programming the IS if developed in-house or for evaluating vendor systems. The design should specify what data are collected, from where the data will originate, and in what format the data would be stored as well as the size of the database and amount of activity expected. All right, so let's determine who's going to build and maintain the system. One of the critical design decisions to be made during the planning process is whether a healthcare facility should build the system itself, purchase it from a vendor, or use vendor services such as cloud computing. Cloud computing is when the system operates on a computer that is owned and maintained by a vendor. This IS is at the vendor's location, not the healthcare facilities, so the information system and its data must be accessed remotely. To do this, a user logs into and accesses the information system exactly as if the data center were located in-house. The data center is the area where the computers and other hardware that runs the various information system operations are kept. Advantages to cloud computing are as follows. Collaboration. Physicians and others share, others can share information, such as the health record at the same time from two different locations. Speed. The speed at which the information system is updated and the speed at which the information is accessed. Mobility. With cloud computing, information is available from anywhere. Privacy and security. Laws and regulations must be met by cloud providers just like healthcare providers. And decrease cost. Healthcare providers do not have to purchase hardware and pay for maintenance of the system. So the cloud computing method is favored by healthcare facilities that do not have staff with the necessary skills to develop and maintain an information system. A disadvantage of cloud computing is that the user may not have much control over the information system. For example, the scheduling of maintenance and the upgrades is up to the host. Another disadvantage is that the healthcare facility is renting the information system. It is not investing in its own structure and therefore would have to take a large investment should it ever decide to bring the system in-house. So the second option is going to be for the healthcare facility to build their information system. If a healthcare facility decides to build an information system, it would be designed to meet the specific needs of that healthcare facility. Creating a prototype is a way to quickly design and develop an information system. With prototyping, programmers quickly develop an information system, show it to the users, obtain feedback, and make revisions to the program, and continue this cycle until the information system is developed. Although this is an option for system design, most information systems designs are much more formal and detailed. The information system would have the look and feel that is desired as well as the desired functionality. There are, however, disadvantages. First, it could take longer to develop. Then the planning has to be more detailed than if purchasing an information system. And if the healthcare facility loses the staff that develop the system, it may be difficult to upgrade the system to meet the needs of the healthcare facility over time or troubleshoot issues that arise. And there could be high development cost. So your final option is a healthcare facility actually purchasing a pre-developed software system from a vendor. The vendor has invested millions of dollars in research and development and has a support system to assist the healthcare facility in the implementation of the information system being purchased. As with other options, there are advantages and disadvantages. A system purchased from a vendor may not be exactly what the healthcare facility wants, but it would be a faster to implement and the healthcare facility would benefit from extensive research and development conducted by the vendor. When working with the vendor, the healthcare facility <clears throat> may have the opportunity to be an alpha site. An alpha site is the first healthcare facility to implement the information. The healthcare facility generally receives a discount in exchange for participation in the development of the information system. Because the information system is still being developed, the healthcare facility may face problems with the implementation that would not be encountered with a more mature version of the same information system. It also takes more time than a typical implementation. The healthcare facility may also be asked to be a beta site. Beta sites are the next healthcare facilities who 
subsequently implement the information system. Many of the problems have been resolved with the alpha site, but these beta sites are likely to encounter numerous problems as well. All right, so then we have to choose between integrated and interfaced information systems. If the decision is made to purchase an information system from a vendor, the next decision is whether the product should be integrated or interfaced. So integrated information systems separate applications that are designed or separate applications that are designed to work together. Data are entered into one information system and then are accessible in the other information systems. Many healthcare information system vendors use this model to interface systems used by healthcare facilities. This type of information system is much easier to manage than the interfaced information system because of the lack of interfaces. Integrated information systems collect, store, and retrieve information from the same database. The information systems have a similar screen design, which makes moving from one information system to another easier for the user. The decision to purchase software from a single vendor is frequently called best of fit. Then we have our interfaced information systems. The products are not designed to work together, but rather are linked through an interface. An interface takes data from one system and plugs that data into another information system. In other words, an interface acts as a bridge between two information systems or databases to translate data into each information system's respective language. An interface has to know what data to retrieve, where the data are located in the first database, whether any manipulation has to be performed, and where the data will be entered into the second database. Although an interfaced information system takes more effort to manage, many healthcare facilities choose this method because users can choose the various products they want instead of choosing a single vendor's product that, for example, may have a wonderful encoder but an inadequate laboratory information system. Choosing the information system based on functionality rather than by vendor is called choosing the best of breed. All right, so we have our system selection steps here. The healthcare facility must identify what they demand from an information system, such as specific functions and compatibility with the existing information systems. This information is used to determine which information system best meets the needs of the healthcare facility. And there's a number of steps in the system selection process. So number one, you have a request for information and a request for proposal. Two, an evaluation of the proposed information system. Three, the selection of an information system. And then four, contract negotiation. So the request for information is a formal document requesting information on an information system. The RFI asks the information system vendor for basic information about the product and how the information system would meet the requirements outlined in the RFI. The RFI can be used to select minor information systems or the information gathered in the RFI can be used to determine who will receive the more rigorous request for proposal, or RFP. This is a type of business correspondence asking for very specific product and contract information that is often sent to a narrow list of vendors that have been pre-selected after a review of requests for information during the design phase of the system's development lifecycle. The RFP is a much more detailed document than the RFI and is critical in the selection process. The purpose of the RFP is to give the vendor all the information needed to propose an IS that meets the needs of the healthcare facility. The RFP describes what information system is needed, the healthcare facility, and the desired functions. Common components of the RFP are the letter of introduction, information about potential vendors, or information for potential vendors, including information about bidders conference, description of the healthcare facility, patient or volume statistics, description of the system, including the technical, functional, and interface requirements, the required format of the response, the instructions for the RFP, request for sample documentation, a request for sample contract, request for a vendor profile, system testing requirements, request for sample resumes of implementation staff, system selection criteria, training requirements, and references. 
And Appendix A will show you a detailed um, template for an RFP, so you can go to Appendix A for that. All right, so we're going to skip over to um, page uh, 59, following up on the evaluation of proposed systems. So the evaluation process used to select an information system should be established during the planning process. The process should have multiple components including on-site and online demonstrations, site visits, review of RFP, and reference checks. In an on-site demonstration, the vendor brings its product to the healthcare facility, either as a demonstration version or a full version of the product. Project team members and other users gather to view the information system and to ask questions of the sales team. The idea is to have as many users and members of the project team as possible to watch the demonstration to see what the information system can and cannot do. All attendees should bring to the demonstration situations they encounter in their daily tasks and ask how the information system would handle it. Examples of situations are admitting Medicare patients, ordering medications, and merging duplicate health records. The on-site demonstration allows for multiple user involvement and is an opportunity to learn about the information. This may be the only chance for some team members or other users to see the information system before implementation. Not everyone can go on site visits to see the information system in a live environment. That brings us to our site visits. Site visits are a great way to view products in a live environment. A site visit usually consists of a small group of team members visiting a healthcare facility, preferably similar in size and characteristics, that has the product implemented to observe the information system in use. During the visit, the project team asks the healthcare, question, asks the healthcare faculty staff questions about the information system. Often, the salesperson for the product will attend the site visit to answer questions and ensure that the project team obtains the information needed to make a decision. And reviewing the RFP responses. The vendor spends a lot of time responding to an RFP, so the RFP should only be sent to the vendors who are seriously being considered. Responding to the RFP is time consuming and therefore very expensive for the vendor. The number of RFPs submitted is typically limited to three to five vendors. The vendor's proposal should be received by a designated person, generally the project manager. The project manager then coordinates the review of the proposals. The healthcare facility also spends hours reviewing the RFP responses because for major information system purchase, purchases, the responses could fill a three to four inch binder. A spreadsheet is frequently developed to assist the analysis of the RFP. And then reference checks. Last one under evaluation of the proposed systems. Healthcare facilities should contact several other healthcare facilities where the product is currently in use. These reference checks are great ways to learn if the other facilities are satisfied with the product without the expense and time it takes to go on a site visit. The vendor will provide a list of references and the evaluating healthcare facility should try to obtain a complete list of client sites from the vendor or independently identify client facilities that are not on the reference list. Best practices recommend that evaluating project team contract contact healthcare facilities from the vendor's reference list as well as healthcare facilities that are clients of the vendor but are not included on the reference list. All right, so system selection. It is the responsibility of the project team to review the responses to the RFP and other evaluation tools to determine which information system will best meet the needs of the healthcare facility. To prevent disagreements over which system to choose, there should be a quantifiable means of evaluating the information systems. One way is to assign points to the RFP review, site visits, observations, and other evaluation methods. If a point system is used during the evaluation process, then the system with the highest number of points should theoretically be the best information system and therefore the one that is chosen. However, this is not always the case because a vendor may have the overall highest score but have low scores and some important functions. And the selection team should not only consider the total points but each individual task as well. 
A useful method of ascertaining the best EHR product and vendor is a weighted decision matrix. This is a method used to help select information systems based on what features are most important to the healthcare facility. For example, compliance with privacy and security requirements is more important and deserves higher weight than the ability to change the color of the screen. Points are typically awarded and the system with the highest number of points is the front runner for selection. And so you can see here on page 61 um, how some ways these are uh, developed and formulated. So you've got one through six and then you've got an actual um, table 4.4 shows the, the decision matrix example. So you can review that as well. All right, so step four, contract negotiation. <clears throat> Once the decision of which information system to purchase has been made, the contract negotiation progress be process begins. Some healthcare facilities start negotiations with more than one vendor. Based on the initial meetings, the healthcare facility chooses one vendor to continue with negotiations. Typically, a contract team, not the project team, negotiates the contract. The negotiating team should include at least the CIO and an attorney. However, with a minor implementation, the HIM director may work with a member of administration. All right, and then we have some contract clauses, things that are covered um, in your contract. These are going to be your software licenses, the delivery dates, warranties and guarantees, the responsibilities of each party, the state whose law govern the contract, the cost, milestones for payment, force majeure, software in escrow, cancellations of contract, version of software to be installed, penalties, acceptance testing, maintenance updates, training, and documentation. So a software license describes what the healthcare facility can do with the software. It controls the locations that can use it, who can use it, and how it can be used. It may also include how many users can access the information system and if the information system is solely by one department or the entire healthcare facility. The healthcare facility is prevented from using that information system in a way outside of the license. Delivery dates are the dates that the software and hardware will be delivered to the healthcare facility. The inclusion of these dates in the contract is important because nothing can be done until the software is available and installed at the healthcare facility. Warranties and guarantees are affirmations the vendor makes for which they are held accountable. And examples of warranties include the vendor that has the legal right to sell the software. If it is found the vendor does not have the right to sell the software, then the vendor is legally responsible. The information system will be available 99.9% .9 of the time. Information system will perform a query within three seconds, and technical support will respond within 30 minutes. Moving over to the right side um, of page 63, that middle paragraph, the cost of the information system is one of the last clauses negotiated. The amount of money paid to the vendor will be based on the responsibilities of the vendor, the number of users specified in the contract, and other clauses. The healthcare facility should require a fixed price so it knows exactly what the cost of the information system will be. Healthcare facilities should never pay the entire negotiated amount or a large percentage of the cost up front. Rather, the contract should then establish payment milestones. A payment milestone is an action that triggers payment to the vendor. This payment is a specified percentage of the total cost of the information system, and this must be negotiated and spelled out in the contract. Typical milestones include delivery of software, go live, and acceptance testing. <clears throat> and then one last term I want to cover with you, or two last terms, is force majeure. This is the legal term that refers to an event or effect that cannot be reasonably anticipated or controlled. This contract clause is designed so that parties of the contract cannot be held accountable to a deadline if there was an act of God that prevented compliance. For example, if an information system is being implemented and a tornado hits the hospital two days before the implementation date so that that date is delayed, the vendor is not held accountable for any penalties as specified in the contract. And then our other one is escrow, source code and escrow. Healthcare facilities have the need to protect themselves in the event of the vendor goes bankrupt. 
One way to do this is place a clause in the contract that requires the vendor to place the source code in escrow. Source code is the programming code that was used to develop the system. An escrow is a situation in which a third party holds a copy of the software in case the vendor goes bankrupt. This means that if the vendor goes out of business, the healthcare facility can obtain the code behind the software so that they can maintain the information systems themselves or hire someone else to do it. The vendor prefers this method as well because it does not want its trade secrets to be widely available. And then last item is acceptance testing. Acceptance testing is a type of testing that occurs after the go-live date. It tests the information system to confirm that it is working as expected as per the contract, RFP response, and any other documentation. It is a critical part of the information system implementation because it establishes whether the terms of the contract have been met regarding performance and functionality. All right, so again, I just scanned this chapter, you know, kind of going through the PowerPoint. So again, be sure to read the entire chapter um, and get those um, review questions answered and um, good luck studying.